Welcome to It's a Woman's World, a show which discusses any and all topics under the sun from a woman's point of view. Moderating today, Ali Nathani. Welcome to the show. Our topic today is Minnesota women experiencing homelessness. This is something I've thought a lot about, particularly when I'm driving around the cities and I see people um, typically holding signs. Um, but today we're going to focus on that topic and learn more about Minnesota women and being homeless. So I'd like to introduce uh, my co-hosts. We have Dr. Susan Strauss. Hey, Ali. Hey, Dr. Susan Strauss. Nice to see you. Good to be here. All right. And Uma Jenga. Hi, Ali. As always, it's great to be here. All right. And Janita Flowers. Hey, how are you? Hey, Happy New Year. I am great. Happy New Year to you. Thank and you. And to all of you. So Thank you. Let's get started with our show. Mm -hmm. And I will introduce our guests. We have Catherine Warner. Catherine is a Hi. community organizer. Hello, and welcome Hello. to the show. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. All right, and we also have Christina Sayers. Hi, Christina. Hi. And you are a community educator at St. Stephen's Housing Services. Yes, I am. All right, welcome. Thanks. Well, Catherine, I think one of the first questions I have as a community organizer, how did you get into the whole homelessness issue and specifically addressing um, women who are homeless in Minnesota? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, good question, because everything has to start somewhere. I've always been involved in community activities, volunteering here and there, all my adult life. And I had an opportunity uh, when I first started working with um, Twin Cities United Way to uh, visit one of their um, financial partners. And I chose uh, uh, Simpson Housing Services, which at that time had uh, uh, two homeless shelters, one dedicated just for women and one just for men. So um, after visiting both facilities and thinking, okay, so what can I or my friends do to kind of help this cause, uh, help, help the folks, um, I organized coworkers to make meals for the women's uh, side of, of the shelter. So what we would do for, oh, several months throughout the year is get together and cook our food, prepare our food, uh, and then bring it prepared and whatever to the shelter. There were 22 women that were living there, so that was a manageable size group to, uh, to feed. Um, but the first time I came into that shelter, um, you know, I, I was a savvy person. I'd been involved in lots of different things, but I was uh, a very shocked and surprised to see women who looked like me, mm -hmm. meaning they were white, Mm -hmm. They were well groomed or you know cleaned up. Mm -hmm. They were uh, some of them had jobs, mm -hmm. um, and they were articulate. and And a couple of them were reading self help books that night that I came there. And I thought, okay, any preconceived ideas I had are out the window. There went the stereotype. There went the stereotype. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that's important because a lot of times mm -hmm. people. Um, base the issue of homelessness on what they see on TV mm -hmm. and so on TV we always see the extreme you see mm -hmm. a person with you know maybe five or six different layers of clothing yes. you see someone with a shopping cart mm -hmm. and bags of things and then that shapes um, sort of the level of humanity that we offer to people who are experiencing homelessness based on what we see in TV how do you how do now you? go and educate um, community members or just you know co-workers or people in the community about the issue of homelessness and how people stumble upon or end up in a situation where they've lost their home I think the, the first thing I talk about is is um, kind of the, the numbers people seem to respond a little bit to numbers um, the Wilder Research Foundation every three years and most recently last fall does a statewide count literally counting how many people are, are homeless and um, I'll interrupt myself and say that the, the sort of general, generally accepted definition of homelessness is if you don't have your name on a rental agreement, uh, a lease, or a mortgage. Okay. So mm. that's kind of, would you agree, Christina? Um, I would like to speak on that too. Um, me as a community educator, we take these people out, uh, a group of people that are, some of them come from schools, some of them come from churches, some of them come from other states. Um, they come to um, St. Stephen's to be educated on what homelessness is like. And for a day in the life of the program that I'm involved with, we take them on uh, trips 
um, walking, within walking distance of what homeless people do during the day um, and educate them that way. Um, along the way in our, in our paths and our journeys, we discuss with them what it is like for us in, in the real life. Um, this is what we do, this is where we go. These are sometimes, on, on Sundays are the hardest because there's nothing open. But this is our path, this is where we go and find um, other people that are similar with our backgrounds as being homeless, um, drop-in centers, day centers, um, places that serve lunch to homeless people, not necessarily homeless people, there's other people that do have homes and shelters that go to these places to eat. Um, there, there, it's a long day of, of walking, so it's, it's, it starts at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning, and it goes all the way until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So there are some people who are like, you know, uh, because of the drug addictness or something oh. like that, they lose, so they fall under the category of homelessness too? If a person does not have a permanent address, they, they are homeless. And the biggest single cause of, of homelessness in Minnesota, and actually across the country, is a lack of affordable housing. That's what I was um, there's waiting lists. If you if you get into the system, there's waiting lists to get on uh, uh, Section 8 housing. There's there's waiting lists to get on so-called affordable housing, mm -hmm. and uh, nothing new is really being built. Um, shelters is were never intended to be a permanent uh, housing option for for folks who who don't have a permanent address. Affordable uh, affordable housing is the single cause. Okay. Of, of people becoming homeless. And then you add to that um, low wages, wage inequity between men and women or among races. Mm -hmm. races. You add to that um, domestic violence. Um, and, and women in particular, when those, um, those issues intersect, women are, are the most vulnerable and the, and the, and the most affected. Mm -hmm. There are more adult men that are homeless than, than women in Minnesota, but uh, uh, women just are more easily um, ending up without, without shelter. And I think, because we, I think I, yeah. yeah, go, go. Yeah. No, I, because they have to take care of the children most of the time, mm -hmm. I think so, right? Because of the family responsibilities that they have, women are more prone to like, okay, have so much responsibilities. That's why I think women are more uh, getting homeless. Yes, I believe yes, them. they are more vulnerable, especially mm -hmm. if they have children. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, single adult women without children mm -hmm. are uh, becoming homeless as well. Mm -hmm. oh. um, lack of employment, like I said, lack of equitable uh, wages, um, just overall high cost of living, mm -hmm. not affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, you just, you know, and, and among women, the group, the subgroup of women, women who are older, 55, 60, oh you know, then that becomes even more of a crisis. And then you add into the mix um, chronic health concerns or maybe just aging health concerns if you don't have health insurance mm -hmm. um, or you can't pay for your, your medicine or whatever, mm -hmm. you're likely to be on the street. If you um, look at the population of women in Minnesota that are homeless, I, can you give us a range of the age and then could you give us the, uh, the mean? What, what do you think is the mean age of women that are homeless in Minnesota? Uh, I can tell you this. Uh, adults in Minnesota are, uh, are fit the age of 22 to 54. That's men and women. 45% uh, of the homeless are adults in that age group. Older adults, they separate that out, is 55 and older. Um, that's actually 9%, which isn't a whole lot, but it's, it's on the increase. Um, women are women adults are not counted separately so much in this particular study that I referenced from the Wilder Foundation but children um, unaccompanied children um, children who are homeless but not with a parent are like 2% but children 17 and younger with their with a parent and usually it's a woman but not always is 36% and if you add to that teenagers who are homeless, and I, I like to share too that teenagers are homeless not so much because they're running away or acting out, they're usually fleeing something, some sort of abuse situation, or they were kicked out of the house mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for some 
any number of reasons. And, and Catherine, if you, and I just want to pause right there for a second sure. because I think that's a really uh, yes. a good point we need to call out. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there are many myths around homelessness mm -hmm. and, um, you know, so for, simply from, well, I saw the sign at McDonald's, so why don't you get a job there, to, to what you're saying just particularly about mm -hmm. teenagers. And, yes. and when you hear that, Wow, doesn't that put a different uh, lens on what the problem is? They are exactly. fleeing uh, from a situation, and we exactly. often think of teenagers, you know, as they're the problem causes, or mm -hmm. they're they're mm -hmm. just being defiant. But I just, as we think about some of the myths, you know, surrounding homelessness, and and I th I think the lack of education um, that is not there with the general population. Uh, you know, can you speak to some of that? Mm -hmm. um, Teens who find themselves homeless have, uh, it's usually like a battered woman situation, domestic violence situation, They're it's usually uh, last minute. There's no preparation, there's no packing, there's no you know, saving up for, there's, mm -hmm. there's none of that. And, they're, and they, have, they lack life skills, of course, like somebody, uh, like maybe their parents. Um, so when they become homeless, it they're extremely vulnerable, extremely vulnerable, and, and um, um, and fortunately, there are more resources coming out to help teens uh, who are homeless. One of the things um, I used to reference um, when I was working with teens that were experiencing homelessness, um, you know, when you think about 15 to 16 mm -hmm. year old age range, and just to kind of put it in perspective, and mm -hmm. you know, think about a cousin, a niece, a sister, mm -hmm. nephew, um, and they're planning their prom, they're going to prom and they're shopping. But then you have another 15 or 16 year old mom's been in a series of abusive relationships and mm -hmm. then she finally finds this guy she really wants to make this work so then there's this tension in the home between the 15 year old daughter and this new boyfriend that comes in they don't get along mm -hmm. and mom made a choice and mom made a choice for her boyfriend and so the 15 year old who normally would be planning to go to prom or some event at school she now had to figure out mm -hmm. what do i do and so she ended up on the street and thankfully in minnesota we do have a we have more and more resources that are becoming available because mm -hmm. we understand this population is very vulnerable and they are experiencing homelessness at higher and higher mm -hmm. rates. Um, but then it becomes this subculture mm -hmm. because now they've connected with other teens. Now they're all vulnerable, but now they've connected and you found someone who understands what you're going through. Mm -hmm. And so there's like this bond that happens, but then there's that pattern of now what do they do? Do they now work towards those goals again, moving back towards home? or do they stay among this new sort of family, um, but they are still vulnerable. And that's an issue mm -hmm. that, I, when I worked with homeless families, that um, we struggled with often, because teens want to belong. Mm -hmm. But the only place I'm belonging right now is with other groups of teens that are experiencing homelessness. So it's, it's trying to figure out when you're 15, you should be able to plan just the whimsical things of life. They're making decisions that are even tough for adults. That's what I found. I don't know if you've seen the similar things. Well, uh, uh, teenagers are the most uh, likely to become homeless in Minnesota of all the groups, and 35% uh, um, of homeless families have teenagers in them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Christina, I'd be very interested to hear your story. Mm -hmm. How did you become homeless? Mm -hmm. How long oh. were you homeless? <laughs> yep. How did yes. you do it. Do it. Yep. I mean, oh, I just think about your vulnerability out there. I think about the increased risk of being raped. I think about where you sleep at night when it's cold like it is now and you can't mm -hmm. get into a shelter. I think I think about it more with this kind of weather than in the summer. But how do you how it's, do you feel it's tough safe and for a woman to be homeless? It is um, mm -hmm. okay. cold cold weather. Winters were the toughest. They were the hardest. Um, I first became homeless in 2006 when I lost my Section 8 voucher. Um, I think that's important to say because um, that was my livelihood. That was, um, I raised, actually raised my son on that, so once my son turned uh, 18, he became of age and I was also given, I went from a two bedroom um, voucher to a one bedroom voucher which suited, was suited just for myself and when I lost that, after I moved from Hennepin County to Ramsey County, um, they had told me, um, Section 8 in Ramsey County had told me that I had um, falsified my application and pulled um, my Section 8 voucher from under me so that um, I couldn't afford housing anymore with the income that I had and I was living on general assistance that was helping me um, pay my rent. Um, how much time I, did you have when, when you lost the voucher, how much time did you have to figure out what's my next step? Yes. Like 30 days, one day? Um, 
I think it was 30 days. Hmm. And then within two months, I was out of my apartment. And so um, what do you do? I mean, yeah. what, what, what do you, I can't even imagine. What do you do? What, what can you take with you? Where do you go? I, all my belongings. I, I um, actually met a guy that, I, that wasn't good for me. Um, mm -hmm. The relationship wasn't good at all. It was uh, abusive in every way. Um, asked me to move my stuff and my belongings with him, my property, into his apartment, and I did, and it was a terrible mi uh, mistake, a decision on my part. So I became homeless when I lost my apartment, and that was a bad mistake, bad choice that I had made. Where did um, you go then? How do you know what to do? Um, I didn't have any resources. I was scared. Um, I didn't know how to survive. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't didn't know who to turn to. I didn't have any family, um, friends. So. Um, so then you moved. So you moved your belongings out of your apartment, and you connected with a gentleman that turned out to not be a positive influence and not good for you. So you decided I needed to move from his place. And at that point, is that when you sort of when you mentioned the nine to four, where you're kind of walking around on your feet all day, and then at night you would just find like a like a semi exclusive, you know, place, you know, under a bridge or you know, yeah, some. I've um, never never experienced the bridge part of it, but um, there were other places like um, parking lot stairwells, um, apartment building stairwells, um, bushes. Oh wow! Um, oh. So like, did you have a blanket or a coat, or how did there, you stay warm? There were times where, um, in cold winter months like this, where we try to go indoors. Um, mm -hmm. uh, downtown, there's a um, shelter called Harbor Lights, mm -hmm. Salvation Army Harbor Lights. Mm -hmm was one resource we could get in there any hour of the night. Weren't there some restrictions, <clears throat> I might be wrong here, as to how many individuals are allowed in at one time, or am I wrong on that? At that time there wasn't, and okay. since I've gotten my own apartment, um, a lot of rules have changed since then, so um, a lot of things have, um, the circumstances with these shelters had changed. Um, they took out a lot of um, beddings, beds, so there's not a whole lot of shelter anymore for women out there. Uh, I, yeah, um, I slept in the hallway on a mattress that was probably an inch thick. Um, we were given sheets as, you know, uh, a sheet for our, our mat and then a sheet for our blanket. Um, the hallways were uh, lit with lights all night long. Mm. Um, there was noise and traffic in the hallways all night long. Um, me being on my feet all day, I, it didn't matter to me. I just put my earplugs in and, and went right to sleep because my feet were tired. I was tired. Was it a safe place? Um, not necessarily for some people who are extremely vulnerable. Um, that would be people with the mental health issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, people well, that were, um, didn't know how to stay for themselves. Mm -hmm. And how did you earn income while you were experiencing homelessness? I, I know you had um, an example of um, something that you used to be able to earn money while you were experiencing homelessness. Um, I still use the resources of general assistance, and I had um, a medical statement through my doctor, my primary care doctor. Um, I was going through my own mental health issues, which was oh. depression and anxiety and those kind of things. Um, all those rooting from even my past, but even more so that I was homeless. Um, the anxiety was real high because of my situation, my living situation. So there, uh, there's no escape from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My only escape from that was um, alcoholism, through alcoholism. Okay. Um, and so what was the big catalyst that changed things for you? Because now you are a community advocate or community educator, you have your own place. What happened and how were you able to make that transition? I had asked, um, in one of the shelters, I had met a, 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 another female, and we became partners, and she um, was a heavier drinker than I, and I had, let's say, gave, I gave her an ultimatum. Do you want to quit drinking, or we need to do some harm reduction or harm maintenance to our relationship, you know, I mean, we, need, we don't have to quit drinking, we just, we need to slow down. Um, she couldn't make up her mind, so I had to make up my mind, um, and I had to leave her behind, but I, during one of our, our, our little arguments, I um, went and got myself a Rule 25. 
Mm. If anybody knows what that is. No. A chemical no. dependency no. Um, exam Dr evaluation. Yeah, oh. drug alcohol assessment. Oh. Um, and I was hoping to hear what they had told me, what, what I wanted to hear, and that was uh, inpatient um, drug and alcohol treatment. So oh. that's what I wanted to hear. What I needed was to detoxify my mind and to detoxify my body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I took advantage of that immediately. Mm -hmm. What was the turning point for you to say, <clears throat> it's time now? Time. I was, um, I always wanted, the only thing that I kept, kept going through my mind is I want a bed. I got tired mm -hmm. of sleeping on the ground. I got tired of sleeping in the hallways. Exactly. I got tired of sleeping on cardboard. Mm -hmm. um, I got tired of sleeping in spaces that weren't good. Um, I even slept in under, under a stairwell where there was nothing but cobwebs under it. And it was like, this is, this is not a way of life for me mm -hmm. or anybody. How long were you homeless nice. before you went into treatment? I'm going to say at least four years. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, gosh. altogether. I, I read uh, that oftentimes homeless women, as a way to at least have some income, will use prostitution as a way to bring in some income. Did you see a lot of that? Um, <clears throat> I know of some women that came from that, had that in their background. Um, in order for me to avoid that, I um, turned to panhandling and signing. I'm not sure, I think everybody knows what signing might mm -hmm. be. You see them, people the signs. Are And you've holding. got yours, oh. don't you? Yeah, I brought my sign with me today. Mm -hmm. Maybe so, we could uh, see it. Yeah. Sure. yeah. It's, it's worn, it's old and tattered now, and I, I wanted to frame it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Um, what does that mean nice. to you when you yep. say you want to frame it? What does that speak to? It does mm -hmm. it does it show victory? I overcame this. Like what is what is the significance of that to you now? Mm -hmm. It <laughs> it um, the significance of this is it it, it tells me where I came from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm you know I'm I'm kind of glad that I had had experienced homelessness. Mm -hmm. You are, huh? I am. Because why? Love you. Um, because I wouldn't have had those skills. I wouldn't have learned any of those skills that I had when I was on the street. Which skills specifically? Um, in order for me to avoid prostitution, this is what I had to do to um, get my money. And when people yell at us to um, get a job, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they don't understand that holding this sign up there for hours at a time is a job. Mm -hmm. This is hard work. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've oh. never heard it put that way. It you know, is. we all have things that go through our mind when we see someone holding a sign. Mm -hmm. Sometimes compassion, sometimes nice. it's judgment, sometimes Simple. it's sadness. Uh, just a myriad of, exp of um, things that go through our mind. But I think it's important to just kind of bring that out again. Um, you made a choice whether it's freezing cold, whether it's hours, as you said, four hours, to hold a sign because you made a choice that I'm not gonna do, use prostitution, put myself in that position. And I've never heard it that way where, hmm, I can make money either by prostituting my body mm -hmm. or by holding a sign. Yeah. And nobody wants to have to even make either of those options, but I've never heard, and I think if people understand some of the decisions and choices people that are experiencing homelessness have to make, because mm -hmm. none of us want to do that. Nobody wakes up and says, you know what? Tomorrow I'm going to be homeless and I'm going to hold a sign and I'm going to just stand here all day and hope somebody will stop was, and give me something. It was more dignified to do that mm -hmm. instead of mm -hmm. yeah. selling parts of my body, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. So when people may who, who drive by you or would yell at you or say, get a job, like mm -hmm. I was saying before, when you see that McDonald's sign where it says, we're hiring. Yes. What would you say to that? This is a job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a job. Mm -hmm. they, and, it, and it hurts to hear that because mm -hmm. they don't understand that that is a job. Mm -hmm. right. that is, it's a hard job. It's right. a hard work. Well, the other piece mm -hmm. is you can't get a job unless you have a permanent address. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Or so an ID. Yeah. Oh, no, even for McDonald's, even you for McDonald's. And one of the too? things um, uh, a shelter will provide, um, and there are several that are that have much better um, uh, facilities mm -hmm. and management than Harbor Lights, but Harbor Lights also provides, you know, dozens of beds that nobody else can accommodate, um, um, is a mailing address. Mm -hmm. So it's really important. Wow. There are wow. shelters where, that that provide mm -hmm. their guests, mm -hmm. their their people, a mailing address, mm -hmm. even for the days they're not staying there. Mm -hmm. So you can have your driver's license, your paycheck, mm -hmm. your whatever, uh, mailed to you to you there. Mm -hmm. So wow. in the just the remaining minutes we have left, um, Catherine and Christina. For people who are watching us right now and are maybe trying to understand this and are hearing our words, you know, what, 
What, what is it you would say you know, to um, understand this issue and to empathize a little bit more and to reach out? What, what, what action can people take to get this better for our community? Um, help with um, affordable housing. Um, that's how, that's what and how I got back on my feet. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Without St. Stephen's help, I, I wouldn't be where I am today. Okay, so some more resources with the affordable housing yeah. um, outreach. Landlords, that landlords that would be willing to help. Okay. Um, landlords that would be willing to go that extra mile mm -hmm. to help somebody. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't see that much, huh? No, not at all. Mm. Pretty judgmental. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and then you have landlords that are raising their rent too. Yeah, so. I just read about that in the paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then some of the rent and <coughs> property is filled with molds and rats and mm -hmm. so forth. That's what we call slumlords. <laughs> slumlords, I've heard that word, yes. Mm -hmm. And so was it the Rule 25 or the Chemical Dependency Assessment, was that the piece that reconnected you to services and then ultimately connected you with St. Stephen's? Or what was that next piece where yeah, you were able to get that stability again? It did, but it, my choice was after treatment was to um, go back into the shelter because okay. I felt like if I was gonna mm -hmm. um, have any part of my general assistance taken from me that I was gonna have my own apartment, so I went back into the shelter. Mm -hmm. And Instead you can't access running. services unless you're in the shelter, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. People don't know about you. Oh. So then how long were you there before you were able to get your own apartment? Um, I went for my first 20. I couldn't get out of treatment unless I had a, um, a bed somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so I um, joined a lottery, and the first week I didn't get it, and the second week I got um, called for to see if I had win, won the lottery, and they said, yes, you had. A lottery had a oh, for, for an apartment? No, for a bed for at the bed. shelter. For a bed at the shelter. Yeah. Yeah. And then how long were you there before you got your apartment? I was there for a month and a half, mm -hmm. two months mm -hmm. maybe. So how most. did you get the apartment? What was your process for that? Um, when we were on the streets, my partner and I, we, we had applied with um, St. Stephen's Outreach mm -hmm. okay. for apartment or housing, and that's where it all began for us when we were, when we were probably two years into our homelessness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, wow. So yeah. after treatment, I went ahead and um, got, got in contact with them, and that's how it all began again. Mm -hmm. I am in awe of your courage mm -hmm. and your stamina Definitely. and, and strength. your persistence, mm -hmm. your strength. And mm -hmm. you are a survivor. I am. Mm -hmm. You yes, really you are. are. You are a survivor. Mm -hmm. You should feel proud. Yes. You. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. You should feel proud. Yeah, I am. Good. <laughs> Come a long well, way. Congratulations. Yes. yes. Trust me. Yeah. So. Thank you so much. Thank We've you. learned a lot today. Yes. 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 In, Good. In, to be thankful Good. to God, right? Yeah. Giving back, yes. survival, Giving courage, back, yes. bravery. Mm, courage, yes. bravery, persistence. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you for being with us today. Thank you. And we thank you for being with us today on It's a Woman's World, and we hope to see you next time.